Kindly turn your Bibles to the scripture that was just read a few minutes ago. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 28. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. I've changed the title a little differently. If you watched on the web, you would have noticed a little different than what you find in the bulletin. From a servant to a king. As we enter into this year 2011, we have been looking into the life of Solomon and learned some important lessons that I believe has helped us to realize as to what is needed for us to experience revival and reformation as individuals, as families, as church family as a whole. For you see, my friends, as you see things happening around, there can be no doubt in anybody's mind if you have little knowledge as to what the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation, in the book of Matthew, in the book of Luke, in the book of Revelation, that what is happening around must remind us that we are living surely at the end of time. And if we have to prepare ourselves for God's kingdom, Revival and reformation is a must. There can be no choice whatsoever. In fact, I was just talking to Elder J. Paul and a few others, Elder Isaac and others, and they were trying to remind me as to what is happening around within the church and outside of the church. The calamities that we see happening around, whether it is in Japan or Indonesia or Burma or Pakistan or Chile or any other place or Haiti or whatever the place that you can talk about, the frequency and the intensity of nature stepping in and disturbing things that has a ripple effect. Do you know that the expense, the cost of costs have gone up because of what has happened in Japan? Not only the Japanese cars, even the American cars, because many parts are made in Japan. Talk about the advanced countries where they have reached a point of bankruptcy. You talk about Spain, you talk about Greece, you talk about Portugal, you talk about our very country here. Do not ever underestimate what is happening around us, my friends. Because I, as an individual, with the little knowledge that I have in the Bible, I am fully convinced that we are indeed living at the end of time, and as such, as the world church experiences our emulate or try to encourage or motivate to experience and revival and reformation, we as remnant church cannot be left behind. We must be part of it. As individuals, we need to be on our knees and asking Lord, in what ways do I need to correct myself? What are the changes? What transformation that I need, that I need to take place? What sins I need to confess? So that I, as an individual, can experience revival and reformation. Solomon, by his own actions, deliberate wrong choices, led the nation into apostasy. For we are read in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 6. At the end of Solomon's reign, these were the words that were uttered. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. And as a result, if you come down to verse 11 of 1 Kings chapter 11, it says here very clearly that God confronts Solomon and says, because you have led your life, your family's life, and the nation as a whole into apostasy, I am going to divide your kingdom. But for David's sake, I will not do it during your time, but I will do it during your son Rehoboam's reign. And so it is at this point in time, we come across for the first time in the history of the children of Israel, a man by name Jeroboam. And the Bible declares very clearly, as we read in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 28, that he was a man of valor. And Solomon realized that here is an young industrious man that I could use him. And he made him as the officer of the family of Joseph. He was in charge. He ruled over the house of Joseph. That was the role. But then at the very bottom of it, my friends, we must realize that Jeroboam was a servant, the Bible declares, in the house of Solomon. And that is why I entitled our meditation this morning as From a Servant to a King. As we begin to meditate upon the life of Jeroboam this morning, 
You must keep in mind that Jeroboam never asked for his kingship. He worked only as a servant in the house of Solomon. In fact, if you read 1 Kings and 2 Kings, 70 times the name Jeroboam is mentioned. But it's unfortunate, in all that 70, most of the time, his reference has to do with negative influence that he had on people. In fact, as we look in carefully, God chose him. God ordained him to become the king, the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel, with Samaria as the capital, with ten tribes under his reign. And the northern kingdom of Israel existed for a span of 208 years. And in the span of 208 years, we notice that if you look in carefully in 1 Kings and 2 Kings, there are 19 kings. But tragically, my friends, the Bible declares that every one of those 19 kings did evil in the sight of the Lord, following in the footsteps of the first king, Jeroboam. And Jeroboam followed in the footsteps of his master, Solomon. This morning as we meditate on the life of Jeroboam, it is my humble prayer that we will try to draw some important spiritual lessons. For I believe that his story can be our story. For I believe that his failures can be our failures. Keep in mind, with the passing of time, man's nature has not changed. With the passing of time, God's dealing with mankind has not changed because God is an unchanging God. And as such, the way he deals with you and me, the way he dealt with the people of the children of Israel, remains the same. And so I strongly believe that there is much that we can learn from this portion of God's word. And so let's get into the first important lesson that we can derive from the life of this first king of the northern kingdom of Israel, a man by name Jeroboam. The first lesson that we derive, turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 26. Our meditation is going to be confined to three important verses. Verse 26, verse 27, and verse 28. And so let's pick up the very first verse. Verse 26 of 1 Kings chapter 12. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. To understand the deeper meaning of this text, to fully comprehend what this text really conveys to us, to know the real implication of this text, my friends, we need to go back to the previous chapter, chapter 11, and see the background, the context in which this text takes deeper meaning and a deeper message for each one of us. Here in the 26th verse of 1 Kings chapter 12, Jeroboam says to his heart, now the kingdom will return to the house of David. We have already established the fact, based on God's word, Based on chapter 11, my friends, that Jeroboam never sought for kingship. God had ordained him. God had chosen him. And God had foretold him that it is going to happen. In fact, because of the apostasy of Solomon, as we saw in, was in chapter 11, God told Solomon that I'm going to divide your kingdom. And in fact, if you look into chapter 11, we have one more incident taking place where Jeroboam, as he's walking out of the city of Jerusalem, he is confronted by a prophet, Ben Mahijah. And Ahijah looks into the eyes of Jeroboam and does something very strange. Here was Jeroboam wearing a new garment. And Ahijah, the prophet, takes away the garment and tears it into 12 different pieces. And then he gives back 10 pieces of the garment to Jeroboam, and he retains two with them. And then he pronounces God's word. He says, the Lord wants me to convey this message to you. That you are going to be the king of the northern kingdom. And just like I gave you back ten pieces of this new garment that you are wearing, you will rule over ten tribes. And as such, God had revealed to him well in advance that it is God who put him on the throne. But unfortunately, not even a year has passed. And here he is filled with fear and says, now my kingdom is going to return to the house of David. In this one short statement, my friends, I see the biggest blunder, the fundamental blunder that he made. He refused to take God at his word. That is the first important lesson that we need to learn from the life of Jeroboam. 
He refused to take God at his word. It is God who told him that he is going to be the king. It is a God who sent prophet Elijah to go and tell him that he was going to rule over 10 tribes. But now, within a year, he is pronouncing doom and tragedy and destruction to his kingdom. It was an author who said this. Then when you begin to question God, when you begin to doubt, when you begin to worry and, and then think about your own manipulation, your own intellect, your own wisdom, your own reasoning, your own logic, you keep God out of your life. Jeroboam had no reason to worry about his throne, about his kingship, because God had put him on the throne. Just as God had ordained Saul, here is Saul, the first king of Israel, going in search of the lost donkeys, and Samuel is told by God to anoint him. Here is a little boy taking care of the sheep on the outskirts of the little town of Bethlehem, and God told Samuel to go to the city of Bethlehem and anoint David as the next king of Israel. And here is Jeroboam working as a little servant, my friends, and God tells to prophet Elijah, you are not going to be a servant, but you are going to be the king, the very first king, not for just two tribes, but for ten tribes. There should have been no doubt in the mind of Jeroboam that God is the one who placed him. And there should have been no apprehension, no anxiety, no worry on the part of Jeroboam. Unfortunately, he did not take God at his word. He did not trust God. He did not trust God's word. He did not trust God's promises. Instead, he depended upon his mind, on his intellect, on his man, human reasoning. That's a very dangerous ground for any one of us to travel in our Christian journey, my friends. We must take God at his word. Because God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That must be the foundation of our Christian existence, of our Christian life. Not what I think, not what I have, not what kind of social connections I have, not what kind of influence that I have that matters in life. But am I in tune with what God wants me to do? If this is what God said it, it may not make sense, but I'm going to do it. It is only then there is victory in a Christian walk. Let me pause here and ask you a very pertinent question. Do you take God at his word? in your challenges, in your problems, in your difficulties, in your disappointments, in your pain, in your hurt, in your tragedies, in your storms of life. Do you take God at his word? Do you believe what he has said? If not, my friends, there is, it is time that we take a second look as, as to how we go about in handling crisis in life. Life is not bed of roses. You will attest it. I will attest to it. But the question that I need to ask you is this. Do you, at every juncture, at every crossroad, when you face a problem, do you take God at his word? A very important uh, cardinal truth that comes to me as I look into the life of Saul to David and to Solomon and to Jeroboam is that God is the initiator. He is the originator. He is the one who creates you. He is the one who formed you. He is the one who calls you. He is the one who chooses you. He is the one who redeems you. He is the one who saves you, my friends. It begins with him. In fact, look into the plan of salvation. It is not Adam and Eve going in search of God, but God coming in search of Adam. In fact, the Bible declares, even before the foundation of the world, the plan of salvation was laid when all the three parts of the Trinity met and decided to do what they had to do. Motivated by love. Energized by their love and for the compassion for the ones that they had created on this planet Earth. Of all the promises that you find in God's word, my friends, nothing is more relevant, nothing is more per pertinent of eternal value than the promise of his second coming. God, realizing as to the danger that we would be facing in the last days, has given us sufficient warnings, suffi sufficient promises about the second coming of Jesus. John 14, verses 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Let's repeat it together. Let's begin together. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, 
I would have told you. And go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. So that where I am, there he may be yours. Why do you think the Lord began to use this promise with this beautiful phrase, let not your heart be troubled? For the simple reason, my friends, you knew that we as human beings, frail, weak, and sinful as we are, we are going to come to a point in time, and we are come to a point in time right now all around us, when we think the future is dark and gloomy, not knowing what's going to happen, whether economically or politically or financially or family-wise, whatever there is, and spiritually above all. And God, knowing as to what we might be facing, he begins by giving that assurance, do not be troubled. And then after he has given you that little counsel, he begins to give you that promise. I will come again. There is no suspicion. There is no doubt. There should be no question in our mind. If there is certainty. There is surety in God's promise. And as such, my friends, we got to take God at his word. That was the first fundamental blunder on the part of Jeroboam. He did not take God at his word. And that brings me to the second point. And the second point, turn, kindly turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 12, and the next verse, verse 27. 2 Kings chapter 12, and verse 27. And look at the verse there. And they shall kill me, and the kingdom shall return, and, and, the, and the kingdom will return to Rehoboam. They shall kill me. The second fundamental blunder that I find in the life of Jeroboam as I meditated, as I prayed about this, as I prepared this message to share with you this morning, is that he became a captive of worry and anxiety. You see the sequence of it, my friends. In verse 26, we saw that he did not take God at his word. And when you do not take God at his word, your ultimate result is that you're going to be a captive to worry and anxiety. That is the second important lesson that we need to learn from the life of Jeroboam. That we as Christians, we cannot become captive to worry and anxiety in life. Why? Because God is in control. It is one thing to plan for the future. I want you to follow me very carefully. I'm not saying standing here and saying you should not plan for the future. We must plan for the future, but we should not be so zealous or more anxious about the future. For the simple reason, my friends, when you worry, when you have anxiety, then there is a lack of trust and a lack of faith. Let me share with you this morning there that worry and trust cannot coexist. They are not compatible. Just like that, faith and anxiety cannot coexist. In other words, I cannot worry in my heart and then say, I'm trusting God. I cannot have be more anxious about tomorrow and then say that I have faith in God. They're not compatible as such. When we begin to worry, we are allowing God to be out of our life. And when God is out of our life, the result, the ultimate result is that we begin to worry. And because he did not take God at his word, Jeroboam becomes a captive of worry and anxiety. Herbert Locker put it very beautifully, said, when you begin to worry, you doubt God's love to save you. You begin to doubt God's power to give you victory on this earth. And then he also said, you begin to doubt God's wisdom to plan your life. How true are those words? When you begin to doubt God, when you, have doubt, when you entertain doubt and anxiousness in your mind, you are doubting God's love, God's power, and God's wisdom to mold you and to shape you and to take you through this earthly journey. And as such, being over-anxious and being worried is not something that God approves. Someone has said it very beautifully. Anxiety will choke the divine plan and highlight the human point of view. Anxiety will take away the joy of today and the gladness of tomorrow. 
anxiety, he went on to say the author, will make you to look at others with a judgmental attitude rather than to accept them as they are. In fact, the Greek word for anxiousness is the word merimno. You know what it means? It means to be divided, to be distracted. But I like the Latin word, which means this. The Latin word is anxious for anxiety. And the meaning, the, the literal meaning of the Latin word is to be strangled or to be choked. That's exactly what anxiety can do to us, my friends. Can you imagine you're, you're being strangled, you're being choked? Your physical life is at stake when you are being strangled and when you're being choked. And mentally you, and spiritually, when you begin to have anxiety and worry, you are being strangled, you are being choked in your spiritual walk with the Lord. And so my urge to you this morning is that whatever the challenge that you might be fa facing, it may be insurmountable in the eyes of human mind, but nothing is insurmountable in the eyes of God and in the hand of God. We must come to a point at, at every point in life and more so when we face challenges to get on to our knees and say, Lord, I just cannot handle this. This battle is yours. I'm going to hand it to you and then move forward in faith. And so it's my prayer that we would allow God to be controlling our factor and not anxiety and worry. No wonder we read in Psalms 127 verse 2, what does it say? In vain do you rise up early and stay up late. Why? Because it's not going to make a world of difference. Anything that needs to happen will happen because God allows it. God promises and God ordains it. That is the Christian philosophy of history. From the Adventist point of view, nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens by accident from God's point of view. Either God allowed it or God ordained it. Not a sparrow will fall to the ground without God knowing about it. If that is true, my friends, you are more precious than a sparrow. And nothing in your life can happen without God knowing about it. And so if God knows about it, if you can seek him and seek his guidance, seek his instruction, seek his direction, surely he is going to take you through the stormy aspects of life. We also read in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, what does it say? Take no thought of your life, what you shall eat or what you shall, what you shall drink. Why? What is the text really telling us? It's not that we should not work for our sustenance. That is not what the text is saying. In other words, do not be so enveloped with what's going to happen to you about tomorrow, about what tomorrow holds, that you begin to lose sight of God and everything is centered around your own challenges in life. And that was the second, that's the second important lesson that we can derive from the life of Jeroboam, that he became a captive to worry and anxiety. No wonder Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 5, 7, what does he say? Casting all your care upon him. Why? For he careth for you. Child of God, let me urge to your heart today, God cares about you. You are not here by accident. You are not here by chance, because God willed it. And God has not brought you thus far to lift you high and dry, to lift you down, my friends. He has come because he wants to fulfill his plan for you. The famous words that we have in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, what does it say? I've got what? Plans for you. In fact, Jeremiah was told that even before he was formed in his mother's womb, God had chosen him. God had ordained him. Every one of us are created by God for a specific purpose. God has a plan for you and me. And it is our desire should be, is Lord, what is that plan? And allow me to fulfill that plan in my life. And that brings me to the third important point. For one time, I'm going to rush through here. The third important lesson that we can derive from the life of Jeroboam is found in the 28th verse of 1 Kings chapter 12. Number one, he did not take God at his word. Number two, he became captive of worry and anxiety. And number three, my friends, he led people to repeat past sins. 
Look into verse 28, it says. And the king took counsel, and he made what? Two calves of gold, and said unto them, to whom? To the people. Listen to this. This is it's just out of the blue, it's so to say. It just shook my mind when I read How in the world can Jeroboam even imagine this thought getting into his mind? What does he say? After making two calves of gold, he says, O Israel, behold, O Israel, this is what? Your God that which brought you out of the land of Egypt. What comes to your mind when you read this text? The golden calf where? In the wilderness. The children of Israel, as they were passing through the wilderness, at the foot of Mount Sinai, when Moses, along with Joshua, had gone up to receive the Ten Commandments, when people began to grumble, he listening to the people, what does Aaron do? He sets up a golden calf, and they go around dancing and playing music and offering sacrifices and saying, this is the God that brought us out of the land of Egypt. And now, after many years, they have occupied the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. And then we have the period of the judges. Now we have the period of the kingship. And now the kingdom has been divided into two. After many, many years, what does Jeroboam do? He leads them back to the past sins. And not only he, but the whole nation is led into idolatry and into apostasy. What a tragedy, my friend. What a blunder on the part of Jeroboam to make people to look into these two golden calves. Eyes are there, but they cannot see. Ears they have, but they cannot hear. They have got mouth, but they cannot speak. They don't have a mind. They cannot answer your question. And, God, and Jeroboam says to the king, these are the gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Let us not be judgmental about the people of Jeroboam's time, my friends. Many times in our own Christian walk, we tend to do exactly what these people did thousands of years ago. By depending upon our own self, uh, as I pointed out, based on our influence or based on our position or status, socially, politically, whatever it is, we try to manip manipulate things to get things done so that we can fulfill what we want, so that my personal agenda could be fulfilled. But my friends, do not ever forget, it is not you that can control your life. It is God who should control your life. Jeroboam made this blunder, the third fundamental blunder, when he led the children of Israel to repeat this past mistakes. Mrs. White very beautifully writes in uh, Prophets and Kings, page 79, talking about Jeroboam. This is how she began the statement. She says, under the rulership of Solomon, Jeroboam showed aptitude and sound judgment. This is to begin with. This is what she says about him. And then with the knowledge, she goes on to say, with the knowledge that, she had, that he had experienced, he was fitted to reign with discreet. That is the beginning part of Jeroboam. But now, in the later part, in the chapter, called Jeroboam, the whole chapter is named as Jeroboam, the title. She says this. Three great blunders that Jeroboam did. Number one, he built two important temples, one in Dan and one in Bethel. First important blunder. Number two, he places these two golden calves in those two temples that he had built, one in Dan and another one in Bethel. And number three, when the Levites refused to work as priests in those temples, he compels, the Bible says, he compelled the lowest of the people to perform the work of a priest. Now all of us know that the work of a priest was confined to whom? To the Levites. Nobody else. It was an abominable thing for anyone else to do the work of the priestly work in the sanctuary. It was confined, it was ordained only to be done by the Levites. And here you find Jeroboam knowing what it is. Knowing that it is blended. Knowing that it is sinful. That he forces, he compels the lowest of the people to perform the sacrifices to these golden calves in these two important places. You see the degradation in the life of Jeroboam? Because he did not take God at his word. As a result, he was a captive to worry and anxiety. And now he result, it results in he leading the children of Israel into idolatry and into apostasy. One sin leads to the next, my friends. He is going down the drain. In fact, if you look into the life of Jeroboam, it, 
the Bible declares, and Jeroboam did evil in the sight of the Lord. And then the 19 kings that followed him, he says, as Jeroboam walked, in the, walked in, the evil, in the evil ways, these kings did evil in the sight of the Lord. An important lesson for us as we live in the end of time, my friends, that we must wake up to what is happening around and realize the seriousness of the time and not follow the mistakes of our past life. Thomas Gunther put it very beautifully when he said, when you seek any pleasure more than prayer, any book more than the Bible, any house more than the house of God, any person more than the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, take alarm, watch out. For you are in a dangerous ground. You are in enemy's camp. There can be no person in your life more important than the Lord Jesus Christ. He needs to be the focus, the nucleus of our lives, my friends. Otherwise, we will begin to repeat the mistakes, the sins, I don't want to call it a mistake, the sins of our past life. And so the counsel comes to us in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall he be established. And believe his prophets, so shall he prosper. Man calls sin an accident, but God calls it abomination. Man calls sin a, 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 a chance, but God calls sin a choice. Man calls sins infirmity. God calls sin iniquity. Man calls sin weakness. And God calls sin willfulness. Man calls sin a trifle. But God calls sin tragedy. Sinning, my friends, is suicidal. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There's a choice that is laid before us. Eternal life or eternal destruction, the choice is ours. And it is my prayer, it is my plea that we, with God's grace, with God's mercy, that we would choose to be on the Lord's side and do what is right so that we can be part of the eternal kingdom that he has gone to prepare. Do not cause sin a mistake, my friends. Sin is sin. Let us not do any sugar coating whatsoever. I like the way Wilbur Chapman, the, a great preacher, tells the story of a preacher that preached on sin very forcefully, very vehemently preached about sin during his uh, preaching time. And so after he preached, he, he, had shook, he shook hands with the, uh, with the members of the church, then he walked down to the basement, got into his study room, and he just sat down in his chair, just to relax for a few minutes. And there was a knock at the door. And so he went and opened the door and there was an important official of the church walking in and said, Pastor, I need to give you some counsel. So the pastor invited him. He sat across the table there and he began to say, Pastor, I like the zeal and the enthusiasm and the passion that you had in preaching today, but I have a little counsel to give you. Do not be so open in talking about the corruption and the guilt of mankind. For you see, when people, young people listen to it, they are going to become more resentful and they may sin more. The pastor thought for a moment to what kind of an answer he should give to his church officer. He turned around on a shelf behind him, there was a little bottle there, and this label that was found outside the bottle was poison. And so the pastor picked up that little bottle and said, Sir, do you mean to say that I need to remove this label outside that says poison and put there an essence of peppermint? Will that make any difference? And then give it to anybody who wants to drink it. Sin is sin, my friends. There is no other way of saying it. I love the way Bill Clinton, one of my favorite presidents of the United States, a brilliant guy, when he got into trouble, finally when he could not escape, what did he say to the whole world? There is no better way of calling sin, sin. 
He confessed it, and today is one of the most popular figures in the world because he changed his lifestyle, realized he confronted himself and said, this is what it is. There is no way I'm going to cover up and live in a life that is not going to be effective. I'm going to confess my mistake. Yes, I did it. I was wrong. It was sinful. And now he's able to contribute positively to the world affairs. That's exactly what you and I as Christians need to do. Do not call sin an accident. It is an abomination. Do not call sin a trifle, my friends. It is tragedy. And so we need to check ourselves, correct ourselves, and re reform, not with our strength, with God's strength. And that is exactly what Jeroboam has, should have done, but he failed to do it. But we have lessons to learn from this portion of scripture. Take God at his word. Do not allow worry and anxiety to envelop you. Instead, you trust God. Do not repeat your past sins, my friends. Move, move forward. Live a victorious Christian life so that we can be part of the redeemed. This morning, instead of the closing song, we're going to have Enoch singing for us a beautiful song that fits in well with the message that I just shared with you. No storm is too great for God to handle. No mountain is too high for you to climb. Listen to these words. Meditate upon it. But more than that, resolve in your heart to take God at his word at all times.